We have been talking about <clears throat> God's golden key. Can somebody tell me what God's key is to everything that we need? Jesus is God's key. If he loved us enough to give us his own son, how much more with him, see, you've got the key, with him will he freely give us all things. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus. Praise the Lord. I am constantly asked on telephone, as you know, we're, we're swamped with calls, long distance calls. People so excited, so, so uh, odd with the fact that, that, that God is moving and speaking in direct ways to the world. <clears throat> and I still get calls nearly every day asking, would it be all right if, if we asked God for an angel to come to well, they use it in the first person to come to me. They say, uh, I feel it would be the very highest, most wonderful honor that I could have. And since you have communication with these beings, would you ask them to come and visit us? And they've given me their address and their name. And you cannot imagine the, the, the list, I mean, it's not just two or three, but many, many that come nearly every day asking, bringing prayer requests to me to give to angels. So when I have opportunity to talk with them, I let them know just exactly the message of the angels <clears throat> that God has brought to man in order to, to remind us of his plan of communication. Praise God. I'm going to have this in my my next uh, pamphlets or book that, that uh, is put out so that people can, can have this because it, it seems to be a general thing. Should I seek an angel? Should I pray God send me an angel? So uh, I, I quote them the words. The very words that, that come from God's heart through the angel. And that is, seek not an angel. An angel cannot abide within you. An angel cannot receive your prayers. An angel cannot accept your worship. But you have one within you greater than all of the angels. One who invites your prayers, one who desires your worship, and one who will never leave you. Do you know who is being made real to us? The Holy Spirit is literally taking Jesus and glorifying him in us. In fact, when Jesus went away, he said, when the Holy Spirit is come, he will glorify me. He will not speak for himself. So when you sense that surge of divine life that's brought to you by the power of the Holy Ghost, Jesus is being glorified within you. His life is being transmitted to you. That's the life of Jesus. Praise God. God's highest goal for us is that we be like Jesus. So many have gotten the, the wrong view of the, of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself told us that when he, the Holy Spirit, has come to you, he will give you power to be like me. He says, power, you shall be, you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, what he's really saying is, when people see you, they will know that I am alive. Because my nature is beaming out from you. My life is within you. 
the highest purpose, the coming of the Holy Spirit, is to glorify Jesus in our lives. Hallelujah. That beautiful fruit of the Spirit that he speak, that Paul spoke of in Galatians 5.22, that he said the nature of Jesus, that the Spirit grows in you is this, love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, faith. Oh, he refers to these things. And then he said, there is no law on earth, no law in heaven. That's against a person being like Jesus. That is what God wants us to be. To be like Jesus. Hallelujah. The golden key that he's given to us gives us power. Literally, it's a key to become like him. The Holy Spirit forming and embodying the likeness of Jesus within us. Hallelujah. I just have to tell you this. Last night, we received a telephone call from uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, the planning is going on right now to uh, bring this message of what God is really like to our nation's capital. Books are being ordered for all of the congressmen, all the senators to have. And the men in high places are, uh, are hearing and they're talking about what the Lord is doing. He still cares for the United States of America. Hallelujah. Did you know that you have a room inside of you where the real you lives? It's a room that your friends cannot invade. It's a room that, that members of your family cannot go into. It's a room where you face those stark realities that trouble you. And the world today has, is visiting the little rooms inside of themselves and are feeling pangs of emptiness and loneliness. One of the reasons for, the, for what God is doing in the world today is to answer that cry within the human heart. If I were to take all of the needs that have been brought to me in, in my praying with people and counseling, one, one need, one situation would have a stack that would far exceed all of the rest. And that would be the condition of loneliness that exists within people. Those that you look at that look like they are the happiest, that have the biggest smile, that can laugh. Those who seem to have everything going for them when they retreat into that little room and they look at themselves where the real them lives. <laughs> There's a cry in emptiness. The world is sick today with a plague, with an epidemic of loneliness. And we have talked about the other keys, the other, the other needs that the Lord has, has ministered to and met. And today we're going to talk about this key for just a few moments here. The key, the answer, God's answer. <clears throat> To that loneliness down deep inside. Even believers, as they go in, inside and into that little room, find themselves uh, so, so lonely. They have a family around them. They have friends. But there are occasions when they cannot even take their family or their friends. The world is dying of loneliness. But thank God for that beautiful word. Shall he not with him also freely provide the answer to this hurting need? 
I think of some of the songs that, that have been written, that express, that have been written by people who have felt the weight and the hurt of these needs. I was thinking of one this morning. Somebody knows when your heart aches and everything seems to go wrong. Somebody knows when your shadows need chasing away with a song. Somebody knows when you're weary, tired, and discouraged and blue. Somebody wants you to love him and to know that he dearly loves you. There's another one that I'll try out on you. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth? and song does he care I, I don't remember remember all the things that the words there but if, if the chorus is like this oh yes he cares I know he cares his heart is touched with my grief uh, though the way seem weary and the long nights dreary I know my savior cares Praise God. Then I remember another one. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. He's the one who always cares and understands. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. And you will know him by the nail prints in his hands. I realize that in our service for God, there are many times of tremendous joy and exuberance. Times when it seems as though we would explode with the dynamite of God's presence. But following those times, like the man, Elijah, who ran in front of the chariot for 27 miles, and then he just finally started crying before God. And he said, God, let me die. He was so glad God didn't answer his prayer. In fact, I don't even think the Lord listened to that prayer. The Holy Spirit changed the wording around a little bit and says, God, I'm lonesome. I need your care. I need some, need some help. But the, the man that was so exuberant had a real letdown. I wonder if this is still true today. Is this still true? I wonder how many of you have times occasionally when you wonder just where the fire and the, uh, the flash and the joy is gone. Does anybody here ever have any letdowns? Can I see your hands? Hey, look at that. There's a few in the balcony that haven't had, but everybody else has had some letdowns. They, that's why they sit up so high. You know, they, uh, they're they on a high all the time up there. <clears throat> but uh, this, this is the reason why God said, I have an answer for you. I have a key for you. Jesus. 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 He is the one that can be with us when, as those disciples were so, so exuberant with him. And the songs were songs of triumph. But then Jesus was the one also who went with them in those low places. He stood by Mary in the garden when the tears were filling her eyes. So she didn't even recognize him. And he said, it's I, Mary. It's me. Mary. She recognized him. I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm just, just totally ruining my homiletics this morning. I have a good little outline I'm going to give you right now, and then I'm going to leave it. You can do whatever you want with it. Somebody said in the early service, they just love a little outline that they can take home in their minds. So I'm going to give you one. They said they liked the four D's I gave them last week. 
less than the ninth. So I'm going to give you something to go with those D's. You can really make alphabet soup here. I'm going to give you three P's. This one. And then I'm going to leave. First one is the predicament. This old world is really in a predicament. There's this plague, this disease of loneliness. Second point, God made a promise to us. So the second word is promise. And in that promise, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, even when you may be feeling kind of down, you can boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. Hallelujah. Do you ever feel like you need a boost like that? Hallelujah. Well, that's his promise that he made to us. Matthew 28, 20, when he was going away, leaving his disciples, he said, You're going out and work for me. You're going to get into a lot of problems and troubles. But I am with you always. God gave us a key. He gave us the answer to the lonely heart. Jesus never, never leaves. You may think he does, but he never, never leaves. The third P is performance. Did he do what he said he would do? Did he perform? Oh, I'll tell you. He did it in Bible times and he's still doing it. We could have, we'd have a thousand testimonies here this morning of how God has performed. He's been with you. You can think of those real low times in your life when you sat, stood by the bedside of one that you loved and you wondered whether he would really uh, prove that as your day is, so would your strength be. But he proved it to you. He was with you. Mark 16, 20. The word tells us that the disciples did what Jesus said he uh, told them to do. He said, go out there into all the world and preach the gospel and lo, I am with you always. So they went out. And what do you think they found? Jesus was with them. And that verse, 16, 20, Mark 16, 20, said, they found the Lord right there with them, just like he was before, working with them, performing, confirming his word with signs, following. One of the things that uh, when Jesus is there, signs follow. People in, the, in this world, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have the evidences that he's there. But there are too, too many people, and this is one of the dangers that we have. We know what God can do, and we've watched him work. But so often, we turn our eyes toward a sign, and we start following the signs. And we think we're just about there. We have learned all the, all the words, the routine, to get that sign to happen. And that sign, somehow or other, turns into the will of the wisp. And we, we can't get it. It's like a, like a, a flitting a fly, a firefly before our eyes. But he tells us, if we walk with Jesus, we, he says, don't look now, but something is following you. Signs of his presence. Jesus is here. Jesus is with you. Do you know that God would a whole lot rather have you following Jesus and let the signs be where he intended for them to be. Have them following you. Do you believe that? It gives you a lot more answer, a lot more of a key to the problems of this life when you follow Jesus. Praise God forever. Mark 6, 45 to 52. I'm going to have you turn to this. We're going to read it. This is going to be the, the message this morning right here. He did perform the thing that he said he would do. And if you have a pencil or a pen, be sure and do some underlining here because this is this is some real good stuff right here. And straightway, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent the people away. 
And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing. Underline that. He saw them toiling. Does that say anything to you? You're out there really. You wonder if he even is paying any attention to you. And the storm and everything is, is contrary to you. And he said they saw them toiling for the wind was contrary to them. Everything that they tried to do, there was just seemed to be a failure and frustration. It was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. Why do you suppose he would have passed by them? Do you think he really would have? He was playing a little trick on them, I think. You know, he, he, he knows us. And he loves to have, hear us call, Help! So he got close enough to them to where they could see him. But uh, the disciples were very superstitious. And you know that our biggest problems come by things that aren't real, things that we just suppose. Have you ever been troubled by things that you were just supposing and you found out, oh, why did I get myself into such a stew? The thing wasn't real at all. I just supposed. And our fears, we're supposing all the time about our fears. And here, their fears suddenly got so bad. You know why they got bad? They thought they saw a ghost. Why? It's a spirit out here. People aren't afraid of, of people, but they're sure afraid of spirits. <laughs> Really afraid of them. So uh, he, he made it, he passed by them. And he, he wanted them to, to call out to him. When they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit. And they cried out, Lord, if you're anywhere within the sound of our voices, would you please come and save us from this spirit? Little do people realize that Jesus comes oftentimes garbed and veiled in our fears, in our problems. Just like with Mary, he stood there right before her. She thought he was the gardener, but Jesus came. Jesus came to them when they cried, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them. And he gave the words to them that can only come from the heart of God. Oh, hallelujah. Do you know that this is the same message that God is bringing today? He's bringing a message to the world today. Be of good cheer. I'm still in control. He's looking. People thought he had, he had forgotten them. But they're toiling with the rowing. Don't worry. He's watching. He's watching you. Hallelujah. And he comes. He comes oftentimes in what seems to be the dark hour, in, in the storm, the thing that is hurting. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure. You know what that means? That means they just couldn't quite contain themselves. The measure means you can only hold so much. But, but they, they were amazed beyond measure. They were acting like a bunch of silly kids there because suddenly Jesus was there. Hallelujah. The storm was over. But that wasn't all that they needed. They needed to get across. And Jesus said, I want to take, I want that, w that we should go across the other side. But the disciples thought he had changed their orders suddenly and said, I want you to go to the bottom. But when he came into the boat, they had the beautiful experience of divine transportation. Immediately when he got in the ship. 
zing, they were there where they were where they needed to go. And we sometimes say, oh, it's such a long way to the thing that I need to accomplish. I just don't know how it could ever happen. But when Jesus comes on the scene, he has a way of pulling all of the distance out. Do you believe that? You know it's true. Hallelujah. God's golden key. And he's put him right in our hands. We have him with us. We have him in our hearts. He's around us. He's watching us. Jesus. Praise God. God's answer to loneliness. The greatest plague in the whole world. God has given us the answer in Jesus. Praise God. I think of the time when he came to the leper. And the leper was cleansed. He thought, I'd never get this. I thought I would never get rid of this stuff. Probably wondered whether he would there'd be any time even in this life that he could ever have this experience. But Jesus, the same one that came when he saw those disciples in need, came to the leper. And the time frame changed. Hallelujah. The circumstances change when Jesus comes. Look what happened at that boat. The sun came out. The clouds pushed back. It was a beautiful day because Jesus came. Hallelujah. I think of the blind men as they sat there in a little world of their own because they could not see, crying out, Oh, Jesus, Jesus, you've come. Do you have a key for us? He says, I do. He slipped his key into the, into the latch of those locked lids. And they could see. He had the answer. Praise God. But the, the, the important thing is this. Never forget it. He still comes. Still he comes. Oh, hallelujah. He still sees you toiling with the rowing. Where it's so hard. It seems like you have a rougher road to hold than anybody. But Jesus sees. His presence is that beautiful key. That key. And you cry out, oh God, are you there? He says, I am here. I will answer, I am here. And there are those hard times in your life. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. He tells us that we're not going to escape some pretty rough times. In spite of what we would like to think. He said, you're going to have some water to go through. You may have some rivers to cross. But listen, when Jesus is with you, the real hurt is gone because the real need is having him there. You read it there in Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee through the rivers. They will not overflow thee. When you walk through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Why? For I am with you. When the Apostle Paul spoke of it in Romans, the, in the 8th chapter, 1 Corinthians, the 2nd chapter, he said we, get, we are often perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do. But we do know this. We do know this, that though we're knocked down, we're not going to be knocked out. We can rise up and keep going again because he is with us. And then in that 8th chapter of Romans, he went on to say that I am persuaded that there is nothing that will ever be invented that can separate me from the love of God. Still he comes. Oh, think of the value of Jesus being with you. Some of you have just experienced the valley of death because of a loved one that is gone. But it was such a comfort to David when he could say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, had he not been able to say, Thou art with me, he would have really been in trouble. He would have said, 
when I go into that valley of the shadow of death, all darkness is going to cave in on me. And the uncertain sounds of something that I cannot have never known, torments and darkness that I've never been through before. But instead of worrying about that, he could, he could say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Do you know what happens when Jesus is with you? He turns the real fears into shadows. Have you ever considered how little harm a shadow can actually do to you? Stop and think about it. If I had a sword up here, and a light behind it, and I swung that sword, swung it right here at Mike Kimmel's you, and that shadow reached right out and went right through his neck. He could twist his neck around and it wouldn't head wouldn't roll off. And you think he would be unscathed, struck, cut clean through with a shadow. A shadow can't hurt you. Shadow of a sword can't cut. The shadow of a dog can't bite you. The shadow of these things that lurk in our lives cannot hurt us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Remember this, that you, the sh you may go through the shadow, but it takes something to produce the shadow. It takes light to produce the shadow. And as you walk through the shadow, the great light of heaven is waiting for you. Jesus is your light. Hallelujah. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Jesus, I know that you're with us today. I know that in this service, there are people who are hurting. There are people who are so lonely, they don't know which way to turn. But Jesus, you promised, I will never leave thee. Oh, Jesus. Come to us, robed even in the shadows of life. Let us know that in that hour of hurt and of suffering, you stand with your heart beating in love for us, with our arms outstretched to us. Oh, Jesus, how we love you. And Lord, I believe this morning in this service, there are people who have had problems. They're frustrated. They're perplexed. They've been toiling with the rowing. The finances have put such pressure on them. It seems like they're losing ground instead of gaining ground. But you have promised, as we look to you, that you are there. Hallelujah. And there is no test uh, of what comes to man, but what you are faithful and will provide the way of escape uh, because you are the key to that, that door that leads uh, out of these things that would oppress us. Oh God, I pray that today uh, will be that day of great liberation and freedom for many, many lives. Uh,